Thank you, Rakesh. Uh, good morning, everybody. My name is Ben Bosley Walker. Um, I'm a director at Planetary Resources based out of Luxembourg. Um, I think what I'm going to say to you is uh, a little bit different to what you might have heard. Naveen has got us with no bones. Um, we have people who are building the ideas um, and taking the heavens and the concepts as far as you can go. I'm going to give you a very boring speech about a very boring company. Um, we are the opposite end of the scale. Um, what we're doing at Planetary Resources is we're not an exploration company. We're not pushing the bounds of, of things to the far as they can go. We're simply providing a simple resource to simple people in a simple way in old school mining, minerals, oil concepts. So what I'm going to talk a little bit about today is what the reality of taking a traditional business and putting it in a highly complex, challenging environment looks like. Um, and then I'm going to touch a little bit also on um, what, the, what the idea of innovation is, how we see innovation, how some of our compatriots in uh, the traditional mining sector see innovation, and, and what that might look a little bit different by. So a lot of my job has already been kind of laid out for me. Um, why asteroid mining? Um, Really, the big problem with space is it's really expensive to get there. Um, and it's also kind of hard to get stuff there once you're there. Um, Planetary Resources, which we came out as a company um, of SpaceX, along the similar lines, technology got cheaper, um, ideas got easier, technology got more advanced. So we can do what before it was only NASA or ESA or China or Russia or India could do with several billion dollars in a government program for a lot less money. Um, we're looking to provide a base resource, resource that can be taken and used um, to build new ideas, new concepts, um, and basically be the, the fuel and the resources of the future. So I don't probably have to tell this audience, but space is now a, a critical part of our, our daily life here on Earth. Um, through transportation, communication, um, manufacturing, settlement resources, all of these things are things that are now part of your daily life here. Um, and we see as human um, activity in space continues to increase, this is going to be something that all of these key things will not only be supporting activities here on Earth, they'll also be supporting um, in situ activities with people or without in space. So again, very expensive to get it up there. Current rocket launch, depending on who you're buying it from, 50 to 80 million dollars. Um, our model is pretty simple. Um, we're focused on two things. Um, in order of priority. Um, second priority is the extraction of minerals and raw materials, things like the platinum-based metals, iron, cobalt, um, which, as we already talked to, people like made in space, 3D printing, additive manufacturing, um, allows you to build bigger, more interesting things that you probably couldn't launch in a rocket. However, our main business, again, we're a simple fuel company. We're the universe's gas station. Um, we're looking at extracting um, water from near-Earth asteroids. Uh, so water divided into hydrogen and oxygen is the drinking water, or water not divided into hydrogen and oxygen, drinking water, um, the basis for potential radiation shielding. But most importantly, once you do divide it, it is fuel to go to Mars, um, to support Bob Bigelow's space hotel, um, to refuel an upper stage of Elon's rocket, um, to make your satellite extend its life so Anita can still have her 1984 flat satellite going for a lot longer than when she started. Um, this really allows us not only to tap into and support the industries of today, but it also allows us to create the building blocks by supplying that steady, reliable flow of materials to build a whole new set of ideas. Um, often people ask me, they go, well, what are you going to do? I'm like, trust me, when they sat down at DARPA, and went, hey, look, we've got this great thing. We're going to call it the internet. Nobody's expecting you to be able to have coffee delivered by an Amazon drone in an hour to your house in LA. Um, my job, as working for a company which is at the very bottom of the value chain, um, is not to tell you what those things are going to be, but to simply provide the platform to do that. So for us, again, without wanting to go into too details, as I appreciate our time constraints, um, these are the kind of asteroids we're looking at. Um, again, the difference of being one of the first commercial companies that are looking at these kind of resources in a slightly different way is we have several requirements that perhaps a planetary mission or a science mission wouldn't need. Um, 
An asteroid might look great, but if it's not going to come back for 200 years, that crashes my business model. Um, I want things that are going to be there regularly. I want things that are going to be exploitable. I want things that are going to be as easy as possible for me and my shareholders to make some money. Um, so we're looking at carbonaceous asteroids, um, probably with um, looking at the extraction of water from hydroxyls. Um, some things to know about asteroids, every asteroid is going to be different. The microgravity conditions, the temperature delta, all of these kind of things make asteroid mining pretty bespoke. Um, so whether or not you're going to be able to go back to lots of different asteroids with the same technology is something that we're going to be able to see. Additionally, when you start, um, when you start talking about mining, um, an asteroid mining, when I first joined the company, you know, my background is in space, and I was like, great, I'm joining this great space company. After about two weeks, I went, wait, this isn't a space company, it's a mining company. Um, and this is, I think, where you start getting into a very interesting conversation of what is innovation and what actually matters in terms of what you can take terrestrially and apply in space and what you can take in space and apply terrestrially. Most of the technology from the mining sector and the oil and gas sector doesn't do much for us. Um, one, we don't really have gravity in the environment we're operating in. Two, a lot of us is about liberating, uh, liberating water, liberating volatiles. It gets a little bit different. But what we quickly learn is if I sit down with Rio Tinto or I sit down with Barrett Gold or I sit down with one of the big mining companies, is about process. When I look at extracting resources, I go, OK, well, where is my customer? Am I going to be delivering them fuel at a Lagrange point? Am I going to process that fuel into hydrogen and oxygen on my asteroid, near my asteroid? Hydrogen has a habit of going bang. So do I really want to put all of that energy into stabilizing hydrogen, or do I move it across wherever I want to go as solid ice? Do I keep it as liquid water? So looking at some of how the process of mining copper or bauxite or extracting oil, where you refine it, how you refine it, we started to see had a lot of interesting um, applications to how we do business. Second is risk. When I talk into a space company, I go, oh, seven years is a really long time. Um, and I'm not, you know, are you sure it's going to work? You know, we've only launched one. It might be a problem. I walk into a mining company and they go, $500 million? Small, not a lot of money. 15 years? Short. <coughs> 2 to 4% of everything that we prospect that we might actually turn into some kind of mine or extracting facility? Yeah, that sounds about right. So for us, when we assess risk, it doesn't look like a space mission. It looks like dropping a deep sea well off the coast of Guinea. It looks like building a gold mine in the middle of Congo and hoping that it's going to work out. And you look at the way that you build data fidelity, it's completely different to how you would build data fidelity and knowing what you know and what you need to know in a space context. Lastly, financing. or well, not lastly, but financing. Um, how do you look at financing? For us, we're an incredibly capex high industry, um, just like mining. We're going to need several billion dollars to get to the point that I would like us to be at. Um, when you talk about space missions, when you talk about a lot of the traditional space business, you know, if I take a meeting with the European Space Agency, they're going to go, what are you commercializing? How are you going to make a widget? How are you going to sell your widget? And then you can have more money to build a bigger widget, and then eventually you'll get to where you want to go. Um, for us, the thing is, is that the point that the payoff comes um, is at the point when we have a standard exploitable production facility, where everything just comes in, goes out, and gets sold to a customer. Nothing exciting, nothing special. So we've started to look at how you can start commercializing other ideas. What's data worth? If you have a mine on, the, on Earth, and you go, well, I think it's got this in it, that might be worth x. You drop a few boreholes, you go, OK, well, now I think that the model of what I have is about this much, and its grade is about this much. That's worth a little bit more. So again, taking some of the ideas of how these things are thought about um, and applying them to a very, very different way of thinking from our traditional history of how we've engaged in space is an interesting thing. Lastly, standards. Um, you talk to a lot of people in the space business, they go, oh my god, it's got to have like 50 different options for resilience, and please tell me it's not going to break, and it's really quite expensive. Oops. Um, when we talk about mining, those standards are very different. Um, not only those standards for the technical classifications, um, but also the standards for what do I tell my investor. Um, 
after a lot of dodgy deals in Western Australia, um, a series of standards got put together by industry to say, this is how you can report what you have. Um, kind of prospecting, resources, reserves. When I look at that, that allows me to talk to my investors in language that they understand. It allows me to talk to my customers going, well, I think I have this much at this level of, of, of probable truth. Okay, well, and when I'm talking about reserves, I'm pretty sure I can do it. I haven't exploited it yet, but I think I can get it out with a bit more money. When I'm talking about uh, or resources, when I'm talking about reserves, I'm saying, I have this much. It's going to cost us this much to get it out. Tell me when you want it. Um, so again, taking standards that perhaps come from a completely different industry and a completely different way of thinking um, allows us to be very innovative in a space context. Um, so again, let's talk a little bit about the value chain. Um, talking about this as a business rather than necessarily this as, a, this as an exploration matter, for us, we're providing a raw product. Um, the second thing is, is that you know, a lot of people talk about um, the exploration piece, the, the journey to Mars. When I look at the journey to Mars, I see an awful lot of associated industries. I see jobs, I see technologies, I see spin-offs. Um, I don't necessarily see loads of people sitting on Mars. We may or may not get to Mars, but the journey of what we do with that and the advances and the industry and the business and the employment that's going to be resulting from all of those associated technologies will be really interesting. For us, those associated technologies in the space context might be logistics. Um, I need to move my product around. Um, I have big companies who are in my office going, hey, well, if, if you need that, then maybe we have a business case. And if we have a business case, then maybe we'll put $100 million investment into building a space tug or a you know, space transporter. Um, well, if you're going to do that, what else can that do? And how does that help? And lastly is, as I said, the new sector creation. Again, I want to be drinking espresso on Bob Bigelow's hotel. Hope it goes well. But if it doesn't, there's going to be a whole new set of things that we can do. When, for example, you don't have to think about um, replacing a geostationary satellite after its period of life. When graveyard orbits become something that we remember as back in the past, um, it completely changes where your investment point is, what you can do, and how long that can continue to exist for. Um, so, defining innovation. Um, space is all about think big, work small. Um, we have these little things, we have a great vision, and we try to solve all of the problems in a bespoke way. It's about being clever and smarter and faster and changing the paradigm. Mining, on the other hand, when they say innovation, what does it mean? It means think small, work big. I found that if I change this one little piece in my automated extraction process and I roll that out over every single mine I have globally, I've just saved myself $200 million. Um, so in the mining terms, that small change creates a massive impact and a massive wave through the whole business. And what you can get at, what you can potentially smelt or separate or extract becomes a completely different thing. So I think what I wanted to say is, maybe we're one of the top 50 innovators, maybe we're not. Um, but when we think about innovation, we've got to think about it in a way that all of these things bleed together. And it's not only about coming up with a smarter widget, it's about thinking about things in a, in a completely different way. So to conclude, um, we're a traditional business in a non-traditional environment. Goodness gracious, we have enough challenges. Call me when we get there and there's going to be some microgravity issues with mining. Um, in terms of, of, of law, of policy, we're building, in many ways we're doing things that we already understand with the, the legal frameworks of, of the space community, um, building on the history we have of how we manage kind of global resources here. The US, Luxembourg and several other countries are, have de developed or developing laws on uh, property rights in space. Um, you know, we see that um, as, again, many parallels you can take. Um, but space resources, I hope, are going to be a game changer for the future. They're going to enable us to do things that we can't even sit in this room and imagine. Because once that floodgate is open, once there is that steady option for being able to exploit this thing which is like turning the water on and on tap, um, that will allow people to come up with cleverer things than I can possibly think about now. Um, the business case and the policy framework, again, 
it's not necessarily coming up with something that is completely revolutionary. It's about taking lots of ideas that work for us in different contexts, putting them in a cocktail shaker, and they come out as a really good martini. Um, so I think, again, as we become more globalized, we're a company that is already, as a small company, is already multinational. Um, this is going to be a challenge that, that becomes much more interesting as we touch all these different pieces of industry, we touch all these different pieces of human endeavor, and we touch all these different countries, regimes, and policies around the world. So thank you very much. Um, hopefully, uh, very soon, all of your resources will be asteroid extracted. Thank you.